The question for today, the myth buster for today is what happens after people die? We know death comes. Absolutely every single one, unless the Lord would come immediately, every single one in this room will die at one point or another. History tells us that everyone who's ever lived has died. Now, you know, some people say, well, Pastor Dave, what about Enoch? And what about Elijah? Elijah went up in a whirlwind and Enoch walked with God. Well, those were two out of the billions, but don't forget, there were more people who died twice. Like yeah, Lazarus, he died, he was raised from the dead, and then later on he would have died again. So he makes up for Enoch, somebody else makes up for Elijah. So the statistic is, is, is better than one to one. And yet we find that many times the things that people understand and believe about death, they believe anecdotally, or like I said the other day, more people take more of their theology of death from the lyrics of pop songs than they do from the Word of God. And so we have a lot of different ideas. And so we're going to be talking about some of these things today. Now, one of the things I, I need to say to you out front, because I think this is very important for you to understand, I come from a family background of people who talk about death very openly. I grew up with all my relatives, the older people that I knew, talking about death very openly. Everybody in my family, everybody in my extended family had planned their funeral when they were in their 40s, and you know, everybody knew all the things that they wanted to do, and, and a number of the people around me. And so I talk sometimes about death very casually. This week, we experienced uh, Pastor, uh, Pastor Mike's father, Marvin, who is, a, uh, in addition to being Pastor Mike's father, is, is a long, I've known Marvin for 40 years. He was a very close friend, and it was wonderful to have him and his wife here this last Christmas. And he passed away very suddenly, and, and sometimes in talking about death and talking about those people that have died, uh, sometimes people find my speech a little bit too casual. And I hope that if there's anybody here who has recently lost a loved one, that nothing I would say would in any way offend you. It is certainly not my intention to do that. However, it's important for us to understand that the Bible speaks very clearly about the topic of death and gives us a lot of information about what happens after death. And so we're going to spend some time dealing with that, and uh, we want to understand those things. Now, just as a way of a preamble, let me say to you that when we talk about the Bible, and we talk about the, the words of the text in the New Testament particularly, uh, the Bible, we refer to it as what's called an occasional document. And that is that the Bible that's gathered to us, inspired by the Holy Spirit, not only in its writing, but in its gathering and in its transmission, protected by the Spirit of God so that we can have the Bible today, is not a... Uh, uh, a, a, like a systematic theology or a systematic sitting down and writing of different things. It came out of the answers that God was giving to the church when it was facing different things. And so because of that, there's no place in the Bible where somebody, uh, the, the answer is specifically given to the question, what happens to people when they die? Because that was not a question that was particularly asked. Apparently, the early church had very, very clear ideas, and we'll find some references to that, that those are not transmitted in the scriptural text to us. And in the early first couple hundred years of, of the, the church, they all seem to have pretty much the same idea as evidenced by art and evidenced by other things like that. But then over time, influences from different kinds of religious faiths and other kinds of things have, have, have brought into the whole picture of what happens to people when they die. And in the modern era that you and I live in, there's an enormous amount of that that comes in. And so we want to understand that this is something that, that has happened all along. Uh, during the time of Jesus, the primary dispute between the Pharisees and Sadducees that was a theological dispute, there was a cultural dispute there as well because the Sadducees were religious rulers. They were chiefs and priests in high temple, and the Pharisees were lay people. But the primary theological argument between those two groups was, in fact, over whether or not there was a resurrection based on the fact that the Sadducees only believed in the first five books of the Old Testament. And the first five books in the Old Testament, there's no real reference to anything like a resurrection or anything like life after death. And so the Sadducees believed when a person died, that was the end of everything. And the Pharisees believed that God was going to resurrect those people who had died. As we live in a world today, we find many, many, many different ideas that have been brought in. People believe that people who die, they linger around, their spirits linger around. People believe that they go and, and then they're in heaven with a whole bunch of things going on and all the different things that we see in heaven going on. Some people in the world, of course, believe in reincarnation and other people believe many, many different ideas. Or, you know. But we want to spend some time looking at the things that scriptures, looking at these different myths and trying to decide whether they're true or not. And so let's take a little bit of time to do this. And as we look at it, let's remember once again, our guide in this is the Scripture. 
Some of the myths that we're looking at are not specifically directly accessed by Scripture. In other words, we have to bring a couple of different things and bring some inferences together. And most of what I'm going to say is mainstream Christian belief, though to be honest with you, there are a few people who might disagree. Uh, well, maybe not a few people. There are some people who would disagree with some of the things I'm going to be sharing with you. But I think the balance of Scripture is pretty clear. So let's take a look here. Myth number one. When Christians, especially children, or Christians or children die, they become angels. When Christians or children die, they become angels. Let's, let's have my little graphic here. I have a nice little graphic up here for this. Yeah. You've seen those kind of pictures before? I mean, don't they look, you know, cuddly and cute and everything else like that? You know, this idea of, of sort of angels as, as looking in, uh, like children who become angels. First of all, I want to say that Absolutely, there is absolutely no passage anywhere in Scripture that suggests in any way, shape, or form that people who die of any age become angels. There is no thought of that at all. Now, it's understandable why people would like to think that. And usually in my context, in a Western context, the time that you usually hear this, and I have heard it a number of different times, is people will say to someone who lost a child that they loved, a child has passed away, and somebody will say to them, oh, God took them because God needed another angel in heaven. Now, the context of that is, is, is a well-meaning context. A person is trying to comfort someone, and they're trying to comfort them by saying that their child is with the Lord, which I fully believe. I fully believe their child is with the Lord. However, the idea that their child then somehow becomes an angel leads to a lot of strange ideas. And one of the strange ideas it is, is that eventually people begin to believe that this angel can influence life in this world and plays a role in different things in life. And I think it's a really a wrong idea. In fact, one of the biggest clues that we have that it doesn't make any sense is that that picture that we saw is nothing like the picture that the Bible gives us of angels. What happened is people began to draw pictures like that, and then people began to think angels were cute and cuddly and all that kind of stuff, and then it's kind of an automatic, oh yeah, little kids become angels. If you look in the scriptures, when an angel usually appears to a person, what does the angel usually have to say? Fear not, right? Isn't that what the angels usually say? If angels are cute little cuddly babies with little wings growing out of their back, why would they need to say fear not? They, they wouldn't be fearful in any way, shape, or form. Angels, as we see them in Scripture, are described to us as being messengers of God. Messengers of God. And whenever they're described to us, when they are, when they are obvious, they, are, they are, are beings that create fear because of the holiness of God and because of the understanding that God has sent a messenger and a message directly to them. And so although the Scriptures doesn't talk about that, it doesn't address it very much, there is no hint at all that people who die, Christian or children or any other one, become angels. The only place where there's anything at all that mentions sort of angels and people in the same breath comes up in Matthew chapter 22. And in Matthew chapter 22, Jesus is discussing with, the, with some Sadducees, and the Sadducees develop an argument, which is they're arguing that there's no, going to be no resurrection. And so in their argument, they have somebody who gets married to a number of different women, and each woman dies and he marries somebody else. Or it's the other way around. A woman gets married to a number of different men. The man dies, she marries a brother, the man marries the other brother, and so on. And then they ask the question, when the resurrection comes, who's she married to? And Jesus says, you err because you don't know the power of God, you don't know the scriptures, you don't understand. And then he says, in the resurrection, people will be like the angels. There will be no marrying or given in marriage. Now what Jesus is essentially saying is that we are resurrected as genderless beings, more or less. We are resurrected with, as genderless beings. And in that sense, there is a similarity with angels. Now, this is always interesting in church because people, do we call an angel a he or a she? Well, the Bible says we don't call them either one. They're genderless. And so this is the only possible scripture where somebody could say, oh, people turn into angels. But that's not what it's saying at all. Now, for you and I, it presents another more complicated thing. As human beings, we have a very hard time divorcing our personality from our gender. And that's because our bodies are, you know, are wrapped up with our whole personality and our bodies have all these, you know, uh, hormones running through them that create us to act one way or another way and all those different things. So it's hard for us to imagine what the resurrected body will be like, but that doesn't mean 
that just because we can't imagine it or understand it, we're going to become angels when we die or even to become angels at the resurrection. Okay, so myth number one. When Christians or children die, they become angels. That myth is thoroughly busted. Okay, I like that new sound. That's just such a busting sound. Okay, now myth number two. If you have a worksheet on myth number two, it says Christians who have died go straight to heaven. And I have to change that because a point that I was trying to make uh, didn't come across very well last night. I was, uh, I was inadequate in my exhortation last night, and so I want to make it a little bit more clear. So now we change. Myth number two is Christians who have died go straight to be with Jesus. Okay, so make sure you change that. I don't want find somebody finding your worksheet later and I get sued for, for a heresy or something like that. And so let's take a look at the things that we know. The first thing that we know, and a very important passage relating to this, comes from Luke chapter 23, verses 40 to 43. Now, this is the story of the thief on the cross. You remember that Jesus was crucified. There was a thief on his left and right, and one of them was abusing him. But in verse 40, it says, The other criminal rebuked him. Do you not fear God, he said, since you're under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him and said, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. So let's take a look and see what do we know about what happens to people after death from this particular passage. Number one, the thief is going someplace. He's going to go someplace when his body dies. He's going someplace. Number two, that place is called paradise. Literally, paradise means a garden or a place of rest. Number three, he's going to be there in the presence of Jesus. It's not just that you're going to paradise, but Jesus says to him, today you will be with me in paradise. So the first thing that we know, something happens. He goes someplace else. It's a place of rest, and he's there with Jesus. Okay, let's continue on. Let's look at Luke chapter 16. Pastor Oyen did a really good job with this uh, with this particular story uh, um, a couple of weeks ago, and so we want to take some time to look at it and be reminded of the things that fit in with our, our story. Luke chapter 16, verses 22 to 24. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. Okay, let's just focus on, not on the overall story, but let's focus on what we learn from this as it relates to Lazarus. What we learn is this, he goes someplace when he dies. And that place he goes to is to be with Abraham. Now, why Abraham? Why not Jesus? Well, first of all, because Jesus is telling the story. Jesus hasn't died yet. It would have been impossible for Jesus to tell this story in this particular scenario or this particular time where he would have been the one that he goes with. Abraham was the father of their faith. It was recognized that Abraham was the person that God used as a way of... Um, a way of working out his plan in the world. And I believe by implication, we would say that he would be with Abraham. There's no hint that they, that, that, that they would be the only ones there. Basically what it's saying is he goes from the earth where he's in torment and he goes to this other place and it's a good place and those people who are God's people are in that place. And the third thing, of course, is it's a good place that he goes to. Now, let's move on to some of the passages that we have written in the epistles. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 to 53, we read this. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. I mean, There's some important things that we learn here. Number one, everyone who dies will sleep. Now that's the terminology Paul's going to use. So he says, I tell you a mystery, we will not all sleep, but we will be changed. And then later on in that passage, he says, he's referring to the dead being rise. In other words, when they refer to somebody who sleeps, they have referred to somebody that their physical body 
has died. So the clear implication is that the physical body is the one that has died. And then in this particular passage, we learn that everyone, whether they are alive when the Lord returns or whether they are sleeping where their body has actually died, will be changed. And at that point, that's where we talk about the resurrection and the, the physical body that we have. And this is the main force of this passage, that flesh and blood keeps us from eternal life because the physical bodies that we have cannot inherit eternal life. Okay, let's go on to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and the second letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. In verses 5 through 9, we read this. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. So we receive the Holy Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing us of a future that God has planned for us. And then this is the important critical part here. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, and I say, would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. Okay, Paul lays this out. If we are in our bodies, if we're in our bodies, we are not with the Lord. If we are with the Lord, we are not in our bodies. There's the two states that we find ourselves possible or have. We're in our body or we're with the Lord. If we're with the Lord, we are no longer in our body. Now, you know, we understand that in, in a broad sense, we all understand that we can be with the Lord and the Lord is with us and all those things. That's not what he's talking about. We are either in our body or when we are no longer in our body, we are with the Lord. Now, there's an interesting sideline here in this whole thing because Paul talks about this tremendous feeling that he has that he, he knows that if he's still in the body, he can serve God so much, but he really longs to leave the body and go to be with the Lord. But as long as the Lord's going to keep him in the body, he appreciates the opportunity to serve God more. I find that really an interesting contrast because for Paul, to be alive is to serve God and fulfill God's purposes. And then no longer alive, he's going to be with God. And he likes both of those things, but he would actually prefer to be with God. One of the things that sometimes happens to me when I'm talking to people and dealing with the subject of death and eternity and things like that, sometimes people tell me, you know, Pastor Dave, I really want to go to be with God when I die, but I'm not ready to go yet. There's so much more in this life I'd like to experience. And I always think, hmm, so you want more of this life instead of heaven? I mean, instead of being with the Lord? Isn't there kind of an anomaly here? Paul's whole point is if I'm in, still in the body, I have so much more that I can do to serve God. And many times in this world, Christians' idea is, man, as long as I'm still here in the body, I have many more than I, things that I can experience. Places to go, people to meet, food to eat, all those other kinds of things. I think we need to understand that maybe our perspective is a little askance on this. But let's remember, in the body or with the Lord. If we're with the Lord... We're not in the body. If we're in the body, we're not with the Lord. Okay, now we're going to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is a major passage from the Scripture that talks to us about these issues. And it comes out of an experience where what happened in the, in the Thessalonian church, what happened was when they all began to follow Jesus, they were eagerly awaiting, they were eagerly awaiting the return of Jesus. And they thought Jesus was going to come back and then they were all going to go to be with him. And they were concerned because some of their members of their group were no longer living. They had passed away. They had died. And they wanted to know from Paul, what happens to them? We're waiting for Jesus to return. We know when Jesus returns, we'll go to be with him. But what happens to those people who already died? And in Paul's answer to this question, we find a lot of really important theological stuff about this topic and other things. So let's read this together. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. Okay? Sleep is the terminology for death. So that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Now, this is really important. Those people who sleep in death are going to come back with Jesus sent by God. Okay, so when they're sleeping in death, they are going to be coming back with Jesus. Therefore, the implication is they are with Jesus and returning with him, even though their bodies are sleeping in death. Okay, let's continue. 
According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede, will not go before those who have fallen asleep or those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down with heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise. After that, we who are alive and left will be caught up together with him in the clouds. We'll all meet the Lord in the air and we'll all be with the Lord forever. Now, here's what we have this important picture. Those people who have died, their bodies are in the earth. Their bodies remain a part of this earth. Their, their personality, their, 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 who they are, and I, I like what N.T. Wright said. Let's not worry about using words like soul and, and other words like that. Those are words that you can use them, but they don't necessarily express the kind of idea that we want. But the person who they are has gone to be with the Lord, and then at the end of time, when God steps in, he's going to send all of them back together with Jesus, and those who are still alive and the resurrected bodies are going to be joined back together, and we're going to join with the Lord together. Okay? And we need to encourage one another about this. When somebody dies, we can say they're asleep and they're with the Lord. So the first thing we learn from this passage, those who sleep are actually with the Lord. Those who sleep, their bodies sleep, but they are with the Lord. They're coming back with him. Jesus is coming back with those who sleep in, with him. Their bodies will rise, and in the resurrected state, their resurrected bodies that rise will be different we meet together with them and the Lord in the air. And this is important. It's the beginning of forever. It's the beginning of forever. Now let's take a look at our myth. The problem with our myth is a little bit complicated. It's a problem of terminology. The problem is not about who is going. It is very clear. Those who are in the Lord, when they go, they go to be with him. Those who are in the Lord. The problem is not when... The Bible is very clear. When, they, when their bodies die, they go immediately. Every passage tells us that they go immediately. The problem is about where they go. Now, this is the point I was trying to make last night. I'm going to try and do a little better job. The difficulty is when people think of heaven as this vast realm of all of these different things, where you have, you know, the devil accusing the brethren and the angels going hither and thither and all of these different things going on. It's the jokes that we've heard all of our life about somebody dies and they go to heaven and there's St. Peter at the door and he has to let them in and, you know, all the different things like that. And the problem is, is that the idea is, is that people have is that when a person die, they go to this kind of vast Disneyland in the sky and they're there doing all of these things and they get involved in all these other activities and things that are going on. And the problem with that idea is then somehow they're made to believe or they come to the implication that these people who have died now have influence in, in the world. That's, for instance, if I can be so blunt, where the practice comes of praying to saints because people think that those people who have died have now gone into heaven and they're involved in all of these different things that are going on and everything else like that. What we find in these passages, what we find in these passages is that when we die, we go to be with the Lord. And it is in a place that is a place of rest. It is in a place that is a place of peace. Do we still have our personality? Yes. It seems to be from the stories that we read, we still have our personality. But the focus of it is as a person that we're with him. And that's the most important thing for us to understand. You say, well, Pastor Dave, what else is going on all around it? Well, I'll tackle that next to a limited degree. But the most important thing for us to understand, especially every single one of us who's lost someone that we know, is that when a person leaves this body, when the body goes to sleep and their, person, their personality is disconnected, that goes to be with the Lord, to be with Jesus in the presence of a place of peace, a place of rest, a place of, of resting. There's no hint that people that go there are asleep. The ones who are sleeping are their bodies, not themselves. They're with the Lord. And that's the most important thing. So Christians who have died go straight to be with Jesus. That myth is totally, totally confirmed. I, thought, I wanted to make sure we switched the right thing there. So it's important for us to remember that. Anyone who dies who is in Christ goes to be with him. Okay. Let's look at myth number three. Myth number three is this. Christians who die gather together. Christians who die gather together. Now, this, this comes out of an often discussion that we have 
where we talk about somebody who died and they're in heaven with other people that we knew and we talk about our relatives gathering together, we talk about friends gathering together and all of these things. It's a common thing that we talk about. I remember my father passed away, oops, 20 years ago. My father passed away 20 years ago. And when my father passed away 20 years ago, everybody said, now he's with his family and with his brothers and with his cousins. Well, he didn't brothers, but with his cousins. And when my mom passed away, we took comfort from the idea that my mom was with my dad. And when Pastor Mike's dad passed away, we talked about, Pastor Mike and I talked about his dad and my dad sitting down and telling stories and and enjoying each other's company like they always did on earth. But we got to ask ourselves the question, is that a realistic picture? Is that what the Bible says? Christians who die gather together. Well, in this case, this is one of those cases where we have to find that there is no scripture that absolutely unveils this. But there are some implications. The implications are the ones that we received in the passages we looked at, the story of Lazarus, where he's with Abraham, where there's communication, even communication with the wealthy man down below. There's all this conversation and everything that goes on. But there's another passage of scripture, I think, that also addresses this. It's in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. In Hebrews chapter 12, the writer of Hebrews has talked in chapter 11 about all these great people who did all these amazing things for God because they're blessed their faith in God. And what's more amazing about these people is they did it that even though they didn't see the Messiah, in faith they believed for God's promise. And the contrast is being made for you and I who have seen the Messiah, have, have, have known Jesus, that we should have the same measure of faith, even the greater measure of faith. And then in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Now, I want to just say this here. Now, I understand that this is a metaphorical use. What Paul is, or excuse me, what the writer of Hebrews is saying is he's using an illustration from the field of sports. And in this illustration, he's talking about how people enter into this, this, this big stadium where all of these people are watching and they're urged on. And metaphorically, perhaps, but certainly implied in all of this is that we experience the same thing, that there is a great cloud of witnesses who are together observing. And this passage, along with other passages, makes, it, makes us understand that they are in this place and that they are together in this place. We know that when we leave this body, we go to be with Jesus. We know from the story of Lazarus We know that we also are there with Abraham. We don't have anything more specific than that, except that we know that everyone who's passed away, everyone who's died, everyone who's fallen to sleep in the Lord is with Jesus. The question we have to ask ourselves is, do we believe that they're all together there with Jesus, rejoicing in the Lord, rejoicing in being with him, in rest, in in, in refreshment, in enjoying that presence? Or do we think that Jesus takes them and puts them in solitary confinement? I don't think so. It doesn't make any sense. And so although the Bible doesn't explicitly say us, I think the overwhelming evidence is that when Christians die, they not only go to be with the Lord, but they go together together with the Lord, with all those other Christians, all the other saints who have died in another place. So Christians who die gather together, that myth is confirmed. Myth number four, if you prepare for death, something bad will happen. Myth number four, if you prepare for death, something bad will happen. You say, well, Pastor Dave, where did you get this idea? Well, actually, I want to use this as a springboard to talk about the influence of superstition in our lives. And and the reason I talk about this is because I've found it to be quite strong, actually, uh, especially, uh, sadly enough, in, in, in people in Indonesian Christian churches. Many, 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 many different times I I found people where uh, a death in their family has left them completely confused and disorganized because they didn't know what was going to happen. And then I'll ask the question, well, wasn't there a will? And then they'll say, well, we never had a will because something bad will happen if you have a will. Now, I, I know there are two issues at play here. Number one issue is this. 
There are legitimately people who believe that if you think about death and talk about death, something bad's going to happen. I've shared with you before, one time I was getting ready to do a wedding, and I gave the vows to the, the, the family that were doing the vows, and I got a message back from the bride's mother. And the bride's mother said, you have to change the vows. I said, why do you have to change the vows? It says, until death parts us. If you use the word death in the wedding, it's bad luck. And bad things will happen. Folks, please. Superstition has no place in the life of a believer. Now, granted, before you're trying to figure out which wedding that was, it was a long time ago, they weren't believers, and they don't live in Indonesia, and they're not part of the church, okay? So, so you don't even know who it was. Just relax. But in addition, there is a sensitivity in Asia that says that if you're talking about someone dying, then it's like you're eager for them to die. It's just too sensitive. You don't do that. Folks, let's, let, I, I want to be as sensitive as I can, but let's be realistic about that. We all understand we're all going to die, and everyone in this room is going to die. And if you have, the older you are, the better your chances are. We're going to divide up everybody that's under 20 on that side, or 20 to 40, 40 to 60, 60 to 80, above 80 over on that side, and we'll just go by the odds as we go down the way. I told you sometimes I'm a little offensive. I don't mean to be. It's good to be prepared for death if you're a follower of Jesus Christ because there's nothing to be fearful of. When a follower of Jesus Christ dies, it is the best thing that's ever happened to them. Don't ever misunderstand that. I have been around people when someone who knew the Lord died and the, and the conversation was about why did this bad thing happen? A person who knows the Lord dying, it is never a bad thing. No matter what the circumstances, no matter what, it is always the best thing for them. Anyone who has gone to be with the Lord is better off than they ever were here, no matter what. You, you know what I'm saying? Sometimes people will say, you know, somebody was very, very sick, and then they go, they, they pass away, and they say, oh, because they were so sick, it's better for them. They're not in pain anymore. My brothers and my sisters, we're all in pain and living in this world. And for us to go to be with the Lord is always better, no matter what our life looks like in this world. Now, for those who are left behind, that's the pain. That's the loss. The Bible talks about don't grieve like those who have no hope, but it doesn't pretend like there's no grieving. Every single one of us who has ever lost somebody that we love, whether they were a follower of Jesus or not, understands the process of grief. But we must also understand that it would be a good thing for us to do for us to prepare for that so that the people who are left behind have left difficult, less difficulty and problem in all of these things that have been prepared. Now, I know this is a little bit sensitive. Let me read a text because otherwise people are going to say, you didn't have anything from the Bible, Pastor Dave. Let me read a text. In Proverbs chapter 13, verse 22, it says, A good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children, but a sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. Now let's look at that, first, let's focus on that first line of that parallelism there. A good person stores, leaves an inheritance for their children's children. Why does it say that? Well, under Jewish law, the Proverbs of the Old Testament under Jewish law, the laws of inheritance were, they didn't need to have a will or anything else like that. Everybody knew what happened. When a man died, everything he had, in fact, before he died, everything he had was divided equally among his sons with this exception. It was divided into one more part than there were sons, and the oldest son got a double portion. So if a man had four sons, when he died, everything he had was divided into five parts, 20%, and then the oldest brother gets 40%, and then the other brothers would get four sons. Yeah, did I say five sons or four sons? Boy, I'm really confused. Anyway, let's say four sons. He gets divided into five parts, 20% each. The oldest son gets 40%, and then 20, 20, 20. So that was standard. Everybody knew and understood what that was. What the, this passage says is a good person prepares an inheritance not only for his children, but his children's children. In other words, it is a good thing for us to prepare for our passing. It is a good thing for us to prepare for the days when we will no longer be here. Now, what I'm primarily talking about here is two things. Number one is inheritance, and number two is insurance. Okay? I'm talking about this for practical reasons. 
Now, I had, a, I had a good conversation with a lawyer, and I talked to him about insurance laws here, uh, inheritance laws here in Indonesia, and he said some things to me that I, I think were important for me to understand. And one of the things he said is, Pastor Dave, inheritance is not as complicated in Indonesia as it is in America because the laws of inheritance are a little bit more spelled out. And so who gets what if there is no will is not as complicated. In the States, if there's no will, it can take forever to solve everything. But what I'm saying to you as Christians is this. You should not be afraid of death. And you should not be afraid of preparing your inheritance to make sure that everybody knows what happens to your things, the things that God has given you, in the time when you go to be with the Lord. I promise you this, you don't need them anymore when you go to be with the Lord. Does everybody understand that? You can't take them with you, even if you put them in asbestos. Yeah? You heard the joke about the guy who had, said he wanted, when he died, he wanted everything turned into gold, and he wanted gold bricks put in the bottom of his coffin because he wanted to take it with him. When he got to heaven, they said, why did you bring paving bricks with you? Yeah. No value. Nothing you have in this world has value in the world to come. But it has value to the people that you leave behind. So please, brothers and sisters in Christ, I understand the reluctance to talk about death. Take the initiative. I am not suggesting you go home, by the way, and tell your parents, okay, it's time for you to drop a will. Okay? Make sure you don't do that. That's not what I'm saying. Those of you who are here, those of you who are watching on the video, prepare your inheritance. Lay it out. Have a letter. Who takes care of your children? That's your most valuable possession. Who takes care of your children? That's critical. And have all that things prepared. Why? Because you need to prepare. There's nothing. It's not going to make it happen because you did anything about it. Secondly, insurance. Now, I know this is even more controversial. I'll let you talk to the financial people. I actually prepared to have somebody do a seminar on in insurance for the people in IES. But, but I have been too many times, let me be blunt with you, I have been too many times with believers whose family members, family leaders went and died, and there's nothing to provide even to bury them. There's no reason for that to happen. You should have as much insurance. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you'd have as much insurance as it makes sense for you to have. I absolutely advocate men have enough insurance to put all your kids through school, have enough insurance to bury you, have enough insurance to buy your wife nice clothes and new bags so she can find a new husband. <laughs> Just kidding. Did you hear the story about the guy whose wife came to him and said, if I die, will you remarry? And she, he said, no, 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 of course, of course I won't remarry. And, and if I remarry, will you, will you bring your new wife to live in our home? No, 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 I would never bring our new wife to live. I'm not going to remarry. And, and if you remarry and bring your new wife in the home, will, will, you, will, you, will you take her all the places you took me? No, 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 I'm not going to remarry, I'm not going to remarry. Will you, will you let her play golf and use my clubs? He said, no, she's left-handed. Hmm. Let's be wise people. I'm not selling you insurance. I have no ties with any insurance agency. But, but whoever you are, death for us is nothing to be feared. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. But whoever you are, listen, when you are absent from your body, people who are around you who love you, they have to be able to cope and deal with things. In my life, I've been with many families in grief, many, 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 many. As a pastor, that's what I'm called to, and I thank God to have an opportunity. But it breaks my heart when I see families who are thrown into very terrible positions because the person who went to be with the Lord did not prepare ahead of time to make that transition easier for their family. Be wise, of course, don't go around forcing other people in your family, non-believers especially, or others who are insecure within this area. But you yourselves, think of inheritance, think of preparation through insurance and investments and all those other kinds of things. Myth number four, uh, if you prepare for death, something bad will happen. That myth is busted. In fact, I can say further, if you prepare for death, 
something good will happen. Because if you're prepared and you don't die, you'll know you've done everything you can. And if you're prepared and you do die, you will, you will be in bestowing something wonderful for your family who doesn't have to go through all the trouble of trying to sort those things out.